This is our time to go before this holy God with, uh, with our praises, our thanksgiving, our, our concerns, um, maybe things that we're dealing with and, and we're needing wisdom this morning, whatever it may be. Um, what, a, what, a, what an awesome privilege, and I say that so often, but just to imagine that we, that you and I, <clears throat> small as we are, can go before this one who created us, who created everything. And he bids us, he bids us to come to him this morning. And he knows what, what you're dealing with. He knows what I'm dealing with. He, he knows if we're on a mountaintop or in the valley. So I want to encourage you this morning as I lift us all up in prayer and you pray silently. You may stand, you may bow your head, you may come forward, you may, whatever your position is, but we are going before Holy God Almighty and he is waiting to hear from you. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh Lord, our heavenly Father God, what, a, what an honor, what a privilege. God, it's more than that, it's humbling. If we just stop for just a, a moment before we give you all the things that we're dealing with, which you already know, be, before we even praise you, God, that we just stop and remember who you are, these words that we just sang. Lord, we sang them from hearts that are so blessed to know you, to have you love us so much, again, God, that you would give Jesus for us. Give me Jesus, Lord. I don't believe there's a heart here or a heart listening in on our live stream. Lord, it wants more of Jesus. The world, no. But your children, God, we do, and we know that we fail. We know that we let the world and worldly habits get into us, Lord. And we ask your forgiveness for that, Father. Father, we know that worldly habits even get into your church. And God, we ask for forgiveness for that. Lord, we just want to, to know you more. We want to get closer and closer to you. We want to be able to yoke with you with confidence and boldness as you bid us to do. And Lord, right now we want to worship you by giving you these burdens that we're carrying around that you don't want us to be carrying around. These anxieties that, that oftentimes, Lord, are a result of garbage, things that are unimportant, Lord. Our relationship to you is important. Whether we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and been taken off that road that leads to destruction, that leads to hell, and placed on the road that leads to eternal life in heaven, God, that's the important thing. And Father, I pray that whatever we give to you here this morning that we shouldn't be carrying, God, that you will not allow us to pick them up and take it back out here this morning. God, if for those who are carrying a burden of forgiveness or unforgiveness, God, I, I pray that when, when you promise, you promise that when we ask you for forgiveness of sins, that you do forgive us. And yet, Lord, we know that there are those who carry around, even though they've been forgiven, they carry around this guilt perhaps even for years, Lord. God set us free from that. You've set us free from death. Now set us free from those things that hinder our walk here and our worship and our, our mission that you have given each of us to do here, Father. And Lord, I pray that you touch each heart, you bless each heart, you bless each family that's here and on the internet, Lord. Bless them, Lord, in a mighty and a powerful way so that they know this could only have come from God. God, we worship you, we love you, we praise you. Lord, as unworthy as we may feel, we know that you have made us worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, God, we just thank you and we praise you for what you're about to do because we have prayed to you, Father. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray and thank you. 
between you. If, uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and, and I hope that you do, I want you to turn to, to 2 Corinthians. We're going to continue our, our study on this, this second letter uh, that Paul wrote to the church of, of Corinth. Um, if you feel so led, take out your outline and, uh, and just follow along with us. Um, this is a, uh, a message that, that really spoke to me as, as I was preparing this. Um, and we're going to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 there in your Bible. I want to talk to you this morning a message that I titled, Finding Strength Through Grief. Finding Strength Through Grief. You know, uh, as I was thinking about this, and I said this kind of spoke to me, uh, as I was thinking about this message and, and what Paul wrote here to the, to the church of Corinth, um, I've concluded that today I have a more profound sense of my sinfulness than I did back there so many years ago, 1974, when God essentially let me know this is your last opportunity. And I knew it was my last opportunity. I believed that because of the sin that was in my life at that time. Now, I know some of you would like me to tell you what this sin in my life was, but I'm not going to do that. we become too transparent today. And there are certain sins that you have and I have that only should be spoken to God and to no one else, perhaps not even to a spouse. But we know that God also has forgiven us. But yet what I find just amazing as, as a pastor and as I've studied and, and grown, I believe, closer and closer to the Lord, uh, it doesn't seem logical, but I feel more sinful now than I did back there when God called me. And you say, well, that doesn't seem logical. I mean, you've been a Christian all these years, and now you feel more sinful. God's forgiven you of those sins. Yes, that's true, he has. But listen, I feel more sinful now because of what God has done in my life. The same thing that many of you he has, he has done in your life as well. We have grown in a sense of sinfulness as we grow closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Want more of Jesus, more of Jesus. The more of Jesus you get, the more sinful you're going to feel. And this is what Paul is talking to the church of Corinth about. You are saved, but you are sinning. And you are grieving God and you are cheating yourself out of the blessings of salvation that God brought to you. And so the closer I get to God, the more small I feel, the more the slightest thing that I may say or do or don't do brings me grief. Well, that's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to do that to us. And so I want us to take a look at this. I've, I've put there in your bulletin uh, a statement that says no one who truly repents will ever regret it or the grief that led to it. I do not ever regret repenting. I do not ever regret God calling out, calling me out of a profession that I loved and called me into the ministry. I don't regret that. I don't regret the grief that I have experienced over the years, not because I became a pastor or a minister, but the grief that I experienced down there in those dark valleys, some of them even the valley, the shadow of death. Maybe it was a loved one's death, or maybe it was just seeing one of my parishioners, so to speak, grieving because of the death of a loved one or grieving because of some sin in their life that has destroyed their marriage or perhaps destroyed even them. And so I want us to look at this this morning. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm reminded um, of a, a basketball player 
from Michigan. You know, we're in the basketball season now, we're in the playoffs of football, and um, there, when Michigan played Wisconsin uh, in basketball, <coughs> excuse me, early in the 1989 season, it was just one of the first uh, games of the season, there was a player on Michigan's team by the name of Ramil Robinson, Ramil Robinson. And I want you to imagine this, one of the first games of the season, but it was an important game because they were focused on the championship that year for Michigan. Many people said they should be the champions. And Ramil stepped to the free throw line to shoot two free throws as a result of a foul. And it was late in the fourth quarter and his team, Michigan, trailed by one point. One point. And so Ramil wanted to regain, obviously, the lead for Michigan, and so he got to the free throw line, and he missed. He got to the free throw line again, and he missed. Both shots missed that could have won the game for him. And Wisconsin upset the favored Michigan basketball team. Ramil felt awful about it. Ramil felt that he left his team down, he left himself down, he cost his team the game, and perhaps it could even be their season, the, the, the national championship. But this grief didn't stop him. And this is why I wanted to share this with you. His grief didn't stop him. From a physical or an emotional level, you know what Ramil did? After every practice, sometimes three and four practices a week after that game, you know what he did? After practice, after everybody else was in the shower, Ramil was there, he was at the foul line, and he would shoot a hundred baskets every, after every practice. A hundred. Now this was a, one of the first games of the season, and he did that up through what turned out to be the championship game. Now you guessed it. Championship game. Ramil was fouled and he stepped to the foul line with three seconds left in the game. Took that ball from the ref, threw it up, right through the net. Took that second shot, right through the net. Michigan won the national championship. Not solely because of Ramil, but it sure had a lot to do with what Ramil did when he felt the grief of costing his team a game many games ago until the point that he did something about his grief. He did something about his grief, and God honored that. I didn't say God was a Michigan fan. I don't believe God is a Michigan fan. I think he's an a and fan. But, but because of what he did when he saw that, that he, in his heart, physically and emotionally, he felt, I failed my team. You know, there's, there's Christians that are failing their families. There's Christians that are failing their churches. There are Christians that are failing their neighbors or even their loved ones. And if that touches anybody here that hears that or listening in, you need to grieve about that. And so that's why I say I thank God for the grief that he has brought in my life from the time I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior until this very moment. And in this text here, in this text, and, and, and since we've been doing this series, you know, all, you know the history of why Paul was writing this to the church of Corinth. You know that they ran him out. You know that, the, uh, that, that some false prophets got in there and false teachers got in there. You know all about that. We've talked about that. But Paul became very angry because of what was happening there. And so he wrote his first letter to the church of Corinth. And then he wrote this second letter to the church of Corinth. And, and that first letter was a very severe letter. And we talked about that two weeks ago. That, that 
what they were doing caused grief in Paul's heart. It would cause grief in your heart if you poured all your life, all your blood, sweat, and tears in the face of persecution. You poured it into someone or something, and that someone or something turned on you. It would cause you grief. It might cause you anger. It certainly did cause Paul anger, but it would cause you grief. Look at what I have done for them. And look at the payback that they have given me. So we talked about that. And, and, and what the purpose of Paul's letter here in the text that we're going to look at this morning was he wanted them to repent of their sin. He wanted them to repent of what they have done, not just to him, but what he, they have done to that church and to the, to the teaching that he had given them about Jesus Christ. And he knew what was happening unless they repented, repented all these blessings because of salvation that we all have, the blessings available to us. He knew unless they repented, they were not going to receive these blessings because of their salvation to God. And so this is the context that he's writing about here this morning. And I believe he, I believe he used this passage here. <coughs> not that he knew us or knew we were going to be here this morning, but God did. And I think this passage is, is, is a, a teaching for all of us to, to repent of our sin, to turn to Jesus Christ, and to not be ashamed to do that, knowing that, that God will forgive us. Paul said, wretched man that I am. Back in Romans chapter 7, I believe it was verse 24, he said, Wretched man that I am, who can save me from this sin of death? And this is what Paul was trying to do here in his letter to the church of Corinth. You know, I want to say something important here, and then I'm going to read this text. But I want to say something I think is, is very, very important. When I repented of my sin... And many of you, when you have repented of your sin, repentance didn't happen just like that. It wasn't instantaneous. Sometimes God works that way, but for many of us, most of us, it doesn't work that way. It's not instantaneous. It takes time that we spend in grief emotional grief, physical grief, whatever the grief is, it takes time for us to go through that grief with the Lord until he brings that true repentance, true repentance into being. So let me read this uh, again with, with the, the message titled, Finding Strength Through Grief. And listen to what Paul said in chapter, <coughs> excuse me, 7. And let me pick it up in verse... Uh, Verse 10. And Paul says, <clears throat> For godly grief produces a repentance <coughs> that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnest this godly grief has produced in you, meaning the church of Corinth, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, <coughs> but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, Paul says, we are comforted. That first letter, he says, I saw what it did, therefore we are comforted. And then he continues in verse 13, he says, therefore we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. 
and his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. <coughs> Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts where we are this morning. God, if there needs to be repentance, let us not wait, but let us do it even now. And Father, we just ask these things, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. You know, uh, there is a poem. Some of you may know the poem. Some of you may have, have uh, uh, memorized the poem. <clears throat> and let me, let me say something up front. I should have mentioned this as we began this. The word grief and the word sorrow in the Greek language are synonymous. And some of your versions have sorrow. And some of your versions have grief. The, the version I'm using this morning, which you heard me read from, is, uses the term grief. Grief and sorrow, the same thing, essentially the same thing. And so this is this little poem. You know, um, I think about it, grief is never pleasant. And I don't mean to, to, leave, to leave that. Grief is never pleasant. But then I'm reminded that uh, my mom used to give me castor oil, and that wasn't pleasant either. But you know what? It did the job. And this is what grief does. This is what God uses grief to do, to, to do the job. The poem, I walked a mile with laughter. She chatted all the way. But I was none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow. And not a world, said she. But oh, the things I've learned when sorrow walked with me. And I think we could all say amen to that. Godly grief, I want to give you four specific um, uh, ways here, which godly grief, as we're going through godly grief, for his purpose is it, that it can strengthen us through this grief. Number one, godly grief is sadness over a, lo over a loss. That's, that's what, it, it's sadness over a loss. It's it's grieving over my sin. Do you grieve over your sin? Do I grieve over my sin? Well, remember what I said, that, that as we get closer and closer to the Lord, even those smaller sins, God says, search my heart, O God, and know my thoughts. I say, search my heart, O God, and know my thoughts. See if there's any anxious way in me. And lead me into the way of everlasting. And so we grieve, and there's two kinds of grief that, that, that is in the Word. There's two kinds of grief here. There's worldly grief. There's the worldly grief that has no power. Worldly grief has no power. It doesn't transform anything. There's no transforming. There's no saving capability. And ultimately, worldly grief leads to death. Ultimately, worldly grief leads to death. And worldly grief is a result of outward circumstances, not a result of something that came in that's inside of us. It. It's outward circumstances that, that just came into my life or perhaps we invited into our lives. You know, uh, there was two shootings this week in Walmart. There were a lot of shootings this week. <clears throat> um, but there were two shootings in two different Walmarts that I was reading about. And one of the uh, store employees was... was uh, was uh, interviewed, and this Walmart employee said, it's not been a good day. He said, I lost my associates, and I grieve over the loss of my friends. You know, we grieve in a worldly way. We grieve, grieve over the loss of a job. We, we grieve over the, a, a divorce. We even grieve sometimes when we have to move. We, we grieve when we leave a church. There's all kinds of ways the world, that we live in this world that, that we grieve. They say a second thing. Godly grief comes from an internal realization of the sin that you and I have committed. The godly grief that he's talking about 
comes from an internal realization. You know, godly grief brings us to that transformation. It, it, it changes us. It, it brings us to repentance. Not just when we were first saved, but as we go along in this life, as we grow closer to God, as, as more uh, things cause us to grieve, it may not just uh, being affected uh, us, but it's uh, the loss of a loved one. It's, it's a child that goes astray. It's, it's whatever. But God takes this, gore, uh, this godly grief, lets us walk through this with him, and somehow we come out on the other end strengthened. Can't put our finger on it, but we know that God has walked with us through this particular thing. And for the, for the Christian, for the world, grief doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't mean anything. And they don't have anywhere to go. I mean, they've got a lot of places to go, but they don't go to God because they don't know God. And so again, their, their walk through grief ends in destruction. They never have this relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet God's there and everywhere, and he's pleading, pleading. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy late. Come to me, all you who need to be saved. And so many, we, we know there's, there's more that they never come to him than those who do. So sin, I don't know, I don't know what you think about sin in your own life. To me, sin, uh, I, I picture sin as blackness, as, as darkness. That I'm praying before God, who is the light, knowing because I've been a Christian long enough to know that he shines his light on me and on my heart, and he knows why I'm there. And he knows what I have given up to him, and he knows what I haven't given up to him. And so when I sin, I just see this darkness. I see this disappointment. I see that I have grieved the Holy Spirit again. God, I've done it again. And that's what God intended, and it's what Paul intended for those at the church of Corinth. See what you're doing. You're doing it not just yourself, not just to your fellow uh, uh, people there with you, your friends, your family, you're doing it to God. Sin is against God. It's not against me. It's against God. And again, that's why Paul wrote this letter to him. You know, grief is a characteristic of the world. Is, it's really a grief over the country. They don't grieve over the sin. They grieve over the consequences of sin. Well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get away with this, and then the consequences hit us. We'll never get away from the consequences of sin. That's not in your outline, but you might want to write that down. You and I will never get away when we sin. Unless we repent, we will never get away from the consequences of sin. And so the worldly grief produces death rather than a contrite falling on your face or contrite turning to God and saying, Oh God, forgive me, for I am a sinner. I'm a wretched man. I didn't want to do that. Paul said, I didn't want to do that, but I did it. And the things you wanted me to do, I didn't do, Lord. Forgive me. And that should be our walk in this life as a Christian. Three steps forward, two steps back, Chuck Swindoll said in the first book I ever read on a Christian level. Three steps, that's a life of, I don't know about you, but it's a life of me. Three steps forward and boom, I get hit back. But you get up and you take those next three steps because you're always taking a step forward. You know, sin in, in the Bible means missing the mark. Rumel for Michigan, he missed the mark. His mark was the basket. His ultimate goal, his ultimate mark was the championship, and he missed that. But he did something about it. And as he was doing something about it, when it got down to the, uh, to the finish line, so to speak, the things that he did, he hit the mark. 
And that's the life of a Christian. We don't always win. We don't always do everything God wants us to do. But we keep our focus on him. We are sinners saved by grace, by God's grace and God's mercy. Every one of us. So if you're feeling down today because of something you did, maybe you did something on the way to church. Well, just ask Christ for forgiveness. Humble yourself before the Lord and repent of your sin. But, you know, there's two ways to miss the mark, according to Scripture. One is a sin, the sins of commission. In other words, we do things, we say things we shouldn't say. Maybe sometimes you lie, sometimes you're temper. You're, 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 sitting, you're, you're committing kin, uh, sins of, of commission. You're saying things that you shouldn't say to that person or persons. Maybe it's for self-satisfaction, but that's what the Bible means in terms of sins of the commission. And then there's the sins of omission. And I got to tell you, <clears throat> you know, James says in, in James chapter 4, verse 17, he says, the things that you, <coughs> that you know to do that are good and you don't do, that's sin. But I think I've got more uh, sins of omission than I do of commission. I think back from the time I became a Christian, the hundreds of times, and that's not an exaggeration, the hundreds of times I should have loved someone rather than being angry at somebody. Or the hundreds of times I should have gone to that person. Or hundreds of times I should have made that phone call because I know that person was hurting or grieved. And I didn't do it. Those, the Bible says, are, are sins of omission. And listen to me, this is huge. It's not, it's not only what we do in sin against God. Equally important to him, listen to me, equally important to him are those things that we do not do. That we claim to be Christians, that we claim to know the word of God. I think of the hundreds of times I should have witnessed to somebody and I said, well, this isn't the right time. <clears throat> or I, 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 I've been in a restaurant I do go to other places other than the McDonald's. But you're in a restaurant and that waiter comes up to you or that waitress comes up to you and you feel, it, man, I want to say something to her. And I don't, or him, and I don't. Sins of omission, well, that is just as important to God as the sins that we commit by sins of commission. It grieves God's heart. When we look at the blessings that he's poured down upon us, the gifts that he's given us, the word of God that he's given us, the different translations, the technology, all those things. And yet, they're all around us. They're all around us. And so many times, for whatever reason, excuses, I have failed. And because of godly grief, I missed the mark of what God wanted me to do. I, I pray, I, I say this, I don't know and I'll never know until I get to heaven. And I may not know it then. But I wonder how many times my missing the mark has caused someone to gain. Caused someone to go to heaven. And I know, and it's no time to, to argue about it, I know there are some who say, well, if you don't do it, God will bring someone to do it. You might want to meditate and think and pray about that. How many times have you and I missed the mark when God, whose purpose was to save those that he elected, and we didn't do it? There's a second type of form of grief, and that's godly grief makes me hate sin. I guess that's what I've been, been saying. Godly grief makes me hate sin. Listen to what, he, what Paul said in verse 11. He said, for see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, 
you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. You know, when there's sin in the life, sins in our lives, there's two important things that we need to remember. Paul says here in verse 11 that sin sets off an internal alarm. That's one of the purposes of the Holy It sets off an internal alarm. I know when I sin. <clears throat> I don't think that's an exaggeration. I also know that when I sin, the Holy Spirit is going to set an alarm off in me because that's one of his purposes. That's what, what he came into my life to do. And he says, in the sight of God, Paul says, in the sight of God, all the Corinthians' actions are before this all-seeing God. Paul says, don't you see that it's not just me, but God is seeing everything you're doing there in that church. God is seeing everything I do. God is seeing everything you do. Well, yes, that's scripture, Ted. That's pre Yes, but it matters. Brothers and sisters, it matters. Believers in Jesus Christ, it matters how we live. It matters when somebody sees us that they don't see our old life, but they see Jesus Christ in us. And so the Holy Spirit sets all this in turn. I am ashamed of my sin. When I do it, I'm ashamed of my sin. When I do it a second and a third and a fourth time after I'm being forgiven, I am really ashamed. If there's a way to be really ashamed, I'm ashamed. And I thank God for that. Because he's going to get me to the point where I'm ashamed enough that I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to listen to him. And then there's the sin that sets off an internal alarm. Then there's a sin that causes us to loathe anything in the lives that disrupt our fellowship with God. Again, Paul uses that word fear there in verse 11. God is the one who is most offended by our sin. Somebody in your church, somebody in my church, they may have offended you. <clears throat> they may have hurt you. But it doesn't compare to how a Christian harms another person and offends another person. Or even, it doesn't even compare to a Christian offending and harming a non-believer. It offends God. I'm offended that you would do that. That's what Paul's saying. I am offended, Church of Corinth, after everything that God did for you, after everything I did for you, I'm offended by your sin. And you need to get your act together. And this, is, this is, is what they did. You know, our repentance leads. It leads, in some cases, to a healthy fear. It leads to a healthy fear. Where we don't fear that punishment or those consequences that may have come because we've humbled ourselves before God. And as Paul said, I did it again, God. As Ted said, I did it again, God and I'm a preacher, and I stand before people on Sunday morning, and I did it again. Thank God. There's a third thing about grief. Godly grief creates in me a desire for the purity of true repentance. Godly grief creates in me a desire for the purity of true repentance. I think about the great power and, and the love of Jesus Christ when I sin. Or when somebody else sins and I'm trying to, uh, to help them, trying to encourage them. <clears throat> but I don't know about you, but it melts my heart. It just humbles me. After all these years, and I do it again. Or I don't do what God has asked me to do. After I claim, I will, and, and I've, I, will sur I surrender all. I will follow you, God, wherever you lead. And then I fail to do that. You know, for Christians, repentance should be an attitude of life. Just as prayer should be an attitude of life, repentance should be an attitude of life. That driver cut me off on 45 today. I should repent for the anger that welled up within me. Oh, Ted, no. God takes the smallest sin so seriously. You know, uh, <clears throat> just finished Thanksgiving, and, and, and the settlers, 
think Colonial American, remember some of them were called the Puritans. And you know what the Pur Puritans' uh, target was, their, their goal was? Their main desire in their lives was not just to believe the Bible, but to live in purity. That's why they were called Puritans. Not just to believe, but put their belief into action. To be purified, to, to serve this Lord. And today, today we have a lot more people that are, start, or that, are, that are seeking happiness than they are seeking purity. And that should cause us all to pray and to be humble. Listen, true repentance is at the very heart and proves. True repentance is at the very heart of a Christian. Let me rephrase that. True repentance is at the very heart of the word of God, and it proves if we are saved. If you're harboring, harboring whatever forgiveness that you need to be doing, if you're harboring this and, and you're not, then God's word says you need to take a look and see your relationship with Jesus Christ. Then fourthly, fourthly, very quickly, godly grief drives me to seek God's forgiveness. That's what we've been talking about. Godly grief drives me to seek godly forgiveness. You know, there are, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands around where we live, where we work, that carry this toxic level, and, and, and I mean this toxic level of guilt and bitterness inside of them. I know that because I've been a pastor for a while. This to it's toxic because it's destroying them inside. When God says, give it to me. You know, we know when we mess up. And the world knows when they mess up. But you know the difference between you and me and between them and us? We know where to go. They don't know where to go. Why don't they know where to go? Well, maybe they haven't listened, or maybe they have rejected when somebody said some. But they don't know where to go, some of them, because nobody told them where to go. How do I get rid of this? How do I get my life in order? How, how do I uh, get my wife to love me again? Whatever it may be. Well, we know because we know the Word of God. And so we are the ones who are the hands, the feet, the voice, and the heart of God to tell them it's simple. Not for Jesus, but it's simple. Can I pray for you right now? And we pray. You know, some of you may remember the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, and Morgan Freeman was in there, and he was playing a, a convicted murderer, and his name was Red. And finally, near the end of this movie, uh, Red expressed his sorrow, his grief for what he had done, and but he came up short. He expressed his grief. But in that movie, there was something really, um, really kind of sly, really something that you really had to hear or listen to or contemplate on. But he came up short because he believed that he had to live with his guilt for the rest of his life. There are people today who are have been forgiven by God. I've told you that so many times, examples. You've been forgiven by God, and they think, well, I've got to live now with this guilt for the rest of my life. And that was Red's problem. He missed the target. Most of us offended the holiness of God by our disobedience. I mean, we offend God. But listen, we don't have to carry that guilt around because of Jesus Christ. The church of Corinth repented. The church of Corinth returned to their roots, so to speak, and Paul was overjoyed. And this is a message for you and for me today. Sinners, yes, saved by grace. Hopefully every one of us saved by grace. But God's arms are wide open for you and wide open for me. And we don't have to carry this guilt. We do not have to. Those of you who, 
if there's someone within the sound of the voice that doesn't know Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you don't have to go to hell. God doesn't send you to hell. You send yourself to hell. And how tragic that would be when it's all free based on what God did with his son Jesus Christ on the cross. Why would you omit, why would anyone omit the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the, the opportunity to go to heaven rather than to go to hell. And God is, this is what God's doing, it's what he does in scripture, he, he offers us this free pardon, this free pardon. Get out of jail free. Get out of that prison that is imprisoning you, do it free. I want you to bow your heads with us this morning as, as we go before this almighty God, this... Uh, this one who, who wants to heal, wants to heal our physical, our emotional, our needs and our, the things that have just kept us from being all that he wanted us to be. Heavenly Father God, we just bow before you humbly. Or perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps there has been some conviction this morning, Lord, by your word. Perhaps not. But Lord, if there has been, I pray that, that even right now, that person will cry out, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a worldly person, and I want to become a heavenly person. I want to repent of my sins. And I want it to be a true repentance, Lord, except I don't know what all that means, except I want to turn away from these sins, God, and I will with your help. I want you, Jesus, to come into my heart because of the blood that you shed on the cross for, for my forgiveness. I want to begin this journey in whatever days you have given me to walk with you, to learn about you. And Father, because you know our hearts, because you know my heart, because you know the prayer that I've just uttered silently to you, I know that I am forgiven because you're a God of love. You're a God who cannot lie. You are the truth. And Heavenly Father, I pray that if someone has prayed that prayer, Lord, that they don't keep it to themselves, but they, they talk to a preacher, they talk to a pastor, they talk to someone who's walking with you that can help them and show them and teach them and disciple them, Lord. Father, it may be as we stand here and, and Lord, just sing a few verses of your invitation, there's somebody here, maybe others, that, that just need to pray. God, they need prayer. And Lord, they too may want to come to the altar. Just something about the altar, made by human hands here. But there's something when your people humbly come before Almighty God. Father, for someone here today, or someone even online that's looking for a church home where they can grow, where they can, they can gain friendship, they can be healed, Lord. And you're leading them here to the pine drive through the Holy Spirit. And God, our arms and our hearts are wide open. Whatever it is, Lord, this is your invitation. Do your work right now, Holy Spirit, in the conviction that needs to be done. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name as we respond. Amen.